uh, welcome to Jeremy. He's going to talk about surviving a legacy code base. Thank you. Hello. As you can see, I am Jeremy. I am usually Jeriff on the internet. Uh, I always forget to put those things on my slides because I don't do most social medias. But if you search for the name of any of my talks, you'll generally find the GitHub repo for them, and then you can find me if you so desire. Legacy code bases. How many people here have not had the lovely experience of dealing with a legacy code base? <laughs> Enjoy it. One day, you will not be one of those people anymore. <coughs> So before we can start talking about legacy code, we need to know what it actually is. And apparently it's running my remote control thing. <laughs> so when I was looking in Wikipedia for some definitions, I found the, what Wikipedia claims is the original definition, the very first one, code for an obsolete computer. I have a program written for a PDP-6. I have replaced it with a VAX. Now I need to write all my software again from scratch because the computer is different. Most of us don't deal with that kind of legacy code, thank goodness. The current definition that I see most often, and th the one that I usually get if I ask someone what legacy code is, is code that is inherited from someone else. This, while it's usually a fairly accurate definition, it has a bunch of problems. Firstly, on one occasion, a very memorable occasion, I inherited some code that was not legacy code. On far more occasions, I found myself writing exciting new legacy code that was legacy even before it left my fingers. <laughs> so it, it's not a very good definition. The visceral definition that accurately describes my state of mind when faced with legacy code, and this is the one I used for a long time, is code that I'm afraid to modify, <laughs> because it is fragile, and merely by e opening one of the files in your editor, you can cause production to break and be down for a week. But when I was doing some research for this talk, I found the definition that I now use, which is a practical definition that points to a solution. It's always great to have a definition of a thing that tells you how to stop the thing from being the thing that it is and become something better. And that is code without tests. Uh, the guy who came up with that definition is Michael Feathers, who wrote a fantastic book, which you should all read, and I'll tell you more about that at the end. But starting with this definition of legacy code as code without tests, or code that is terrifying to modify because it has no tests and you don't know if it broke, uh, the first step in getting your legacy code under control is to get it tested. So, write some tests. Yay, let's go home, we're all done. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not that easy. So, in order to start writing tests, we need to know why isn't it that easy? What makes it difficult? And usually, it's because legacy code wasn't written to be testable. It wasn't written TDD style, it usually doesn't have any tests at all. Sometimes it does, but they're terrible tests. Most of the legacy code I've received has an attempt at a test, or three tests, and they're all broken, and nobody's bothered to fix them because testing is hard. And it is hard if your code is spaghetti, if you've got a thousand line functions and methods, if everything is global mutable state, and I want to change this thing, so I will just write it into this global module level dictionary somewhere, and then everything else will pick it up, and it's great, and then someone else changes it underneath you, and everything falls apart. But probably the biggest thing that makes testing it hard is tightly coupled dependencies. 
I have a piece of code that I want to make a change to, but my function starts by creating a database connection, connecting to the database, fetching some information, making an API call to some remote system, getting a response from that, making another database connection to a different database and writing the response there. To test this, I need two databases and a third-party web service on the far side of the internet. Great, I will set all those things up in my test and phone the telco that I'm talking to to please make sure that any messages I send during this test run don't actually go to people's phones in Nigeria and cost me money. A uh, bit hard to automate that. <coughs> Legacy code gets worse over time because it's hard to test and changing it is scary. It doesn't get refactored. refactored. Um, the code stays bad. Things get hacked in because it's scary to change. So instead of refactoring this thing and breaking this piece apart from that piece so I can put my new code in between, you just very carefully add three lines to the middle of this gigantic method, which will hopefully do what you want, and you test it a couple of times, and you send it over to QA and hope that nothing breaks. And sometimes you get lucky. But all is not lost. We don't have to give up. We don't have to throw it all away and rewrite everything from scratch and go out of business because we're rewriting it from scratch. We can make legacy code testable if we do it very carefully with limited controlled changes to the untested code so that we can write tests for the, the code and add new code that is tested. And before we get on to all the gory details, let's start with a small example. So I have a celery task that I want to modify. This is, um, it is actually real code. I have that star star others uh, parameter there is just so that I could fit it easily on the slide because there are like 20 parameters to this celery task. Um, but this is actually real code, legacy code that I had to modify and um, make testable. So I have a celery task that creates a virtual machine. I, want to, I wanted to do something different. But the very first thing it does is create a remote Zen server API session to talk to a VM management system on some metal in a data center that runs my production virtual machines. So how do I test this? I don't want to modify my production virtual machines while I'm running my tests. So I break up the function. I, have, I take basically everything that is not the call to get session, put it in a new function, which takes the session object as a parameter, and then I call the new function from the old function. I build a test double for the session object so that I don't have to talk to a real Zen server API. You may notice that while that is a fairly simple step, it is not a trivial one. And then I write some tests. So things to note about this process. One small change to the legacy code. The green, um, I'm not sure how well it shows up on the slides, but Basically, these two lines, those are the only differences. If you do a git diff, this is the stuff that shows up. That's the only change, and it doesn't chan change the behavior of the code at all. All we do is add an extra function call, and everything else is the same. The flow of the code is the same. We didn't change the, the function signature, so everything that calls that function, which I think is actually called as something that isn't a salary task in places. Um, everything that calls it uh, continues to work. We built a test double that we can use for other things, because as I'm sure you've guessed, if we have a create VM function, we probably have a destroy VM and make VM sing and dance. And we can now start making safe tested changes 
a couple of days after we actually wanted to start making safe tested changes. But we've spent that time improving the code and getting it tested instead of trying to figure out why everything is broken because we deployed it and it doesn't work. So I kind of glossed over the and write some tests part. If you've been in any of the other testing related talks today or yesterday, uh, there are all sorts of great practices for writing tests and writing code with tests. And most of them, very sadly, don't apply to legacy code. Because generally it's code that you don't understand. You know it does a thing, you sometimes have a vague idea of what the thing is, and you have no idea how it does that thing. So, firstly, focus on the task at hand. Usually the reason you're touching legacy code, because it's a terrible thing to do and you will hate your life if you do it too much, is because you have a change that you need to make. In my case, I needed to allow this create VM function to let me add a second network interface so that I could have a private backlink between my virtual machines. So all my Docker containers that are talking to the database are not doing it over the same network interface as the front-end web server that is listening to the internet. So only test the code that you are changing now, the code that is relevant to your changes. Uh, it would be great to test all the other code as well, and if you had unlimited time, by all means, go for it, but then you may as well just rewrite from scratch anyway. Uh, and hacks are okay. They're not nice, but if you have 10 lines of really nasty hacky code that monkey patches all sorts of things so that you can safely get your legacy code under test, then you've got code that you can test, and later, once you've finished making this change, you can start cleaning things up and do some refactoring and get rid of those ugly hacks. But ha the hacks are the things that let you make the changes to the untested code so that it can stop being untested code. And then the kinds of tests you need to write are different from <laughs> tests for new code. You're writing tests to understand what the code is currently doing, what its current behavior is, so that you notice when you've broken it. Uh, not if, when. Legacy code never works the way you expect it to. So write, a test, write tests that answer the question, what does it do if I give it this input? If I ask my create VM function to give me a VM with a certain amount of storage, what calls does it actually make to the remote API? What data structure does it build? Oops, not that button. And copy the expected values, the things you're asserting against, from the actual output. Don't try and predict what it's going to do because you will get it wrong and you'll just waste a whole lot of time. So I tend to write code that says, uh, call this function, print out the result, assert false and then I copy-paste the result into assert response equals whatever, and then I run it again to see what the differences are between the last time I called it and this time, and after seven or eight or 15 iterations of this, I have a test that reliably works for this particular input and output and stuff like that. So that's kind of the, the theory in the background. So how do we actually do this in practice? Let's say we've got an example that is slightly more difficult than one dependency that you can mock out and uh, have a small change to test the internals of a thing. So starting with some tools. Static analysis is your friend. Flake 8 is my weapon of choice. Uh, Pylint is also good, I'm told. I had a bad experience with Pylint many years ago when there was a new release which added about 17,000 new checks and I really didn't want to go and edit all my configs to make my old code stop being read everywhere. So I switched to PEP8 and PyFlex, but both are good. When you're using these tools, turn off all the warnings that you don't care about. It doesn't matter for the purposes of did I break this code, 
whether you have lines that are longer than 80 characters or 800 characters. It doesn't matter what the spacing between your functions and methods and classes is. It does matter whether you're trying to use a variable that has not been assigned or whether you've got, well, probably not whether you've got unused imports, but there are a bunch of things that these tools will tell you that are useful for knowing, well, not necessarily knowing whether you've broken code or not, but pointing out some of the places where you may have broken stuff. Uh, or even better, places where you're doing a whole lot of work to set a variable and then you're never using it anywhere, so maybe you could just get rid of that code. And automated refactoring is also great because machines are generally better at all the detail work of finding the thousand places this function is called and changing the order of the parameters or renaming it or whatever than people are. I don't use these tools very much myself, mostly because I have a severe IDE allergy. Um, I was bitten by Java as a young person. Uh, but PyCharm, I have a bunch of friends who use it very successfully and are happy with it. And Rope is kind of a standalone tool that does static analysis and refactorings. And if you use an editor with a refactoring Python plugin, it's probably using Rope under the hood. So these are good if you want to make some fairly mechanical changes, like splitting out stuff into multiple methods or adding a parameter to a, a method or a function and finding all the places where you need to change things because if you do it by hand you will probably break stuff. And the most important tool of all is the human brain. You are going to be spending a lot of time trying to figure out what this code is doing, why it works the way it does, trying to figure out if changing this thing over here is going to affect stuff over there because if so, you're probably going to need to write tests for those things as well. And after the tools, the first and probably the most important technique is breaking dependencies. We saw a simple example of that earlier with the remote <coughs> Zen server API. Uh, we can't test a thing that calls out to a Zen server API, so we want to have a way to test it that doesn't do that, so test doubles are your friend. Don't call a database, call a thing that pretends to be a database. Don't call this gigantic, terrible object that is hard to instantiate. Call a thing that pretends to be that and make sure that your calls back and forth are what you expect them to be and that they match what actually happened before you made your changes. Again, that's not the button. So how do you get your test doubles into the places where they need to be? Because obviously you, in order to call your fake database, you need the fake database to be where the real database usually is. So break up long functions like I did earlier. That's one way. Uh, add parameters to things, which is more or less the same, except you're just not breaking up the function. You're moving the get session or whatever you're calling to the place where the function is called. Encapsulate global references, which is a wonderful technique that's not limited to this, which I'll explain in a moment. And use seams, which I will explain just after that, because it's a, um, a really cool thing that um, is hard to explain briefly. So global dependencies. It's a fairly common pattern in twisted code where you have a global object which does a bunch of stuff. So the reactor which manages all your process <laughs> schedules and your asynchronous I.O. and stuff like that. So instead of using the reactor directly, which a lot of code would do, uh, at the top line here you assign your global reactor to a class level attribute. And then in your method where you call it, you call self.clock.whatever instead of reactor.whatever. And then in your test, you just set transport.clock equals your fake object. In this case, um, it's a fake object provided by Twisted that pretends to be time passing, 
and you can schedule stuff in the future, and then you can tell it, 15 minutes has passed, run all the things that should have run in the past 15 minutes, and you can test time-based things without having to wait for the time to pass, which is really useful when your time-based things are wait five minutes so that we can pretend to be unthrottled and then see if all the code that runs five minutes later actually ran. Usually it doesn't, and then you have to debug it. <laughs> so, seams, as promised. A seam is a place where you can alter behavior in your program without editing in that place. Again, Michael Feathers, his book is wonderful, you should read it. Um, the great thing about this is you can get your test doubles into the place they need to be without actually opening the file that you need to, well, the file for the code that you're trying to test in an editor. Um, there are a whole lot of different kinds of seams, which Michael goes into in his book, but the ones that are relevant to Python are things like module imports, because you can import a different module instead, or you can tell Python that, no, this module is actually something else. Uh, function and method calls, because there are various ways to kind of uh, sleight of hand swap those out underneath your program, and attribute lookups, which are kind of the same as method calls and whatever. So, ways to exploit these. The heaviest way is install a fake library. So, I once had a friend who was complaining that he couldn't run his application on PyPy because it had a dependency on PyCrypto, which has um, a million lines of C code, which only works with CPython. Uh, this was before CPyX had a whole bunch of support for things like that. And his code didn't actually need to use PyCrypto. The stuff it, the framework used it for wasn't used by his application, but at startup, it initialized PyCrypto, it called a couple of methods on it, so his program just didn't work because PyCrypto wasn't there. So I wrote a, a little thing called fake plastic PyCrypto, which you can find on GitHub if you want to, and all that does is pretends to be enough of PyCrypto. It says, yes, I'm PyCrypto, initialize me, great, return happy, call this method, okay, I will do whatever you say, and throw the result away, <laughs> and that's enough for um, his code to run on PyPy. Uh, you can do this for your, your tests as well. You, can, you probably want to uh, swap in a real test double instead of a fake plastic one. But installing a fake library is hard, uh, and it's a pain, and now you've got different dependencies depending on whether you're testing or running for real. So, monkey patch things. Um, most testing frameworks now have helpers for this so that you don't end up with, well, things that will unmonkey patch after your test method, whether it passed or failed or through an error or something, which is important. Otherwise, you end up with the same thing monkey patched a thousand times and it doesn't behave the way you expect it to behave in the test that wants it to not be monkey patched. Um, so be careful with that. Uh, and subclass and override, if you've got a class that you want to test. This is really useful for code which is slightly less legacy, and all API requests go through, for example, a self.request method, because then what you can do is, instead of testing the class, you subclass it, you override the request method with something else which doesn't actually make requests, and slot your test double in that way. Um, so, another example of breaking a test dependency with a seam, back to our uh, happy fun VM management software. You can tell this is real legacy code because previously create VM was spelt uh, snake case and now it's spelt camel case. Um, this, these functions do basically the same thing as the previous one does. But if you look carefully, you will see that update server calls update VM asynchronously through Celery, and then update VM makes its own session object. So if you want to test that update server calls update VM the way it should, 
which you want to do if you need to make changes to these things. For example, to make sure that you're not trying to update unresponsive servers or unresponsive VMs, which then take several minutes to not respond. And then you build up um, three and a half million, I think was the biggest we saw, uh, tasks waiting in your queue full of Django model objects, which then get rewritten back to the database and overwrite the changes you made manually in the hours between that task being fired and that task running. Legacy code. <laughs> so <laughs> you could possibly extract get session before, but that requires a lot of change. You need to somehow find a way to get a session into a Celery task that's called asynchronously from somewhere else. Uh, so instead, you write a test that monkey patches it. Uh, in this case, I'm using PyTest's monkey patch fixture. Uh, most of the other testing frameworks I've used have something very similar. Uh, and all our test does is get the, the tasks module, um, replace the get session function in it with the one that uh, returns our test double, and then the rest of the test is written as if um, we were actually talking to a real Zen server except through our double or whatever. So it's ugly, it's monkey patching, uh, it's easy to screw that up. A word of warning about pretty much all of these things where you're swapping in test doubles underneath something else, you kind of need to make sure that your test doubles behave the same way as the thing that they're doubling for. Because if Zen Server changes its API, but your test double doesn't, uh, all your code passes all the tests, everything seems to run happily, except when you deploy it to production, you get the wrong kind of VM, and then everyone is sad. So most of these techniques require making changes to untested code because that's the way you, you make your code testable. Some of them don't, but uh, if you're very lucky, you can get away with just monkey patching and stuff. But for the most part, you can't. So the way to do that safely-ish is to separate your new code from your old code. So all the new code you write, that's new code. You can write a TDD. You can write your tests first. You can make sure that the code is tested, that it works the, the way you expect it to, that you will notice when there are regressions, all of those good things. And then you kind of slot that into the old code where necessary. And you're making a small change. OK, I should have pushed that button first. So new code can be tested in isolation. It is testable because it's new code that you're writing with tests. And the changes to the old code are very restricted. You're only making the minimum change required to call your new code from the old code or whatever. Um, you're not completely rewriting a function or something. The disadvantage is, is that now your spaghetti is spaghetti with meatballs because you've got all this legacy code spaghetti code paths and flow over here and then this code over here, instead of just going rambling through this code, it now jumps to your shiny new place where you've got um, some ravioli or meatballs or something nice and encapsulated and well tested. And then it goes back out to your terrible legacy code. But more importantly, your old code doesn't improve. In fact, it gets worse because now you've got your spaghetti with meatballs. You've got more complicated code flows. You've got this stuff that logically belongs with this code over here, but actually it's over there so that we can test it. So do this carefully and clean it up later. Because generally, if you're making changes to legacy code, that's not the only change you're going to make to the legacy code. I needed to add a uh, second network interface to my VM. Now I need support for adding extra disks so that our databases can have SSDs on them. Uh, I haven't made that change yet, but it'll be much easier than the previous change because now I have code that is at least partially tested and I can start cleaning up some of the, the hacks and do a little bit of refactoring with a certain amount of confidence that 
If I break things too badly, I will probably notice before it gets pushed to production. So, we're programmers, we like algorithms. The legacy code algorithm. Step one, identify the code that needs to change. This is often non-trivial because you've got this gigantic spaghettified uh, code base and everywhere you think your function is or your functionality is implemented, it's actually a call to somewhere else through abstraction layers that are the wrong shape, etc., etc. But eventually you find the place that you're you need to change to uh, add your feature or fix your bug. <coughs> Step two, break the dependencies so that you can write tests for this code so that you're not calling out to remote third-party services in your tests. Step three, actually write the tests. Uh, and then the last two, make the changes you want to make all the way down at the bottom of the algorithm. And then step five is... I don't want to say optional because it shouldn't really be optional, but sometimes it's not possible. So if you can, refactor it so that your legacy code becomes less legacy and more real code that you can actually work with and improve. And read this book. It is a fantastic book. I really wish I had read it several years ago when I first started working with legacy code. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't, so I had to learn all of these lessons the hard way. Um, this book goes into a whole lot of detail that I haven't had time for in a 45-minute conference talk slot with some questions at the end. Um, it's not Python-specific. In fact, I don't think it even mentions Python at all, except maybe once in passing. A lot of the examples are in Java or C++. Um, a lot of the, the tools and techniques are not necessarily relevant to Python, but there are similar things that you can do, and you can get ideas for uh, maybe cunning new ways to break your dependencies and trick the language into giving your code what it needs in the tests, but uh, what it needs differently in production. Um, and it's really easy to read. I read the first third of it, in the car on the way to a holiday, and my girlfriend was unimpressed because she wanted to have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of my slides, but we still have some time left, I believe. So ask me questions. I prefer the easy ones, but I'm willing to answer the hard ones. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, questions, Pi. Uh, hi there. Um, can you talk about using tools like um, Hypothesis and MyPy to like check and explore legacy code? I did a talk two years ago about Hypothesis, and I actually haven't written enough new Python code uh, to have been able to use it much, so I've forgotten most of the details. But it's a fantastic tool. It's generally less useful for legacy code because you know that your legacy code is terrible and it's going to break it break if you give it unexpected input. So Hypothesis will just tell you stuff that you already know. Um, it's a great tool for, I mean, it might be a good way to figure out where the edges of acceptable input to your code are. Um, it's worthwhile, look at using it, but um, it's not one of the standard tools I use for this. And also MyPy, it's one of those things that works better for new code than for existing old code that doesn't conform to any standards and you have no idea what it's going to do with its, its variables. So those are things to usually that you use towards the end of the process once your legacy code has been at least partially delegacified and you can start doing proper testing and things like that. Do we have more questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I just have a question with regards to what has been your approach um, towards management, product owners, CTOs, in actually um, making them realize the scope of the problem with the legacy code system. 
and that there actually needs to be an intervention and this intervention is going to take time and it's um, ultimately unavoidable. What are some approaches that you've used? So if telling them exactly what you've just said now doesn't work, then I say, okay, I will make the, fi the fast, um, quick, hacky change and I am not available after hours and I will be turning my phone off for the weekend. <coughs> Um, so please make sure that someone checks that I haven't broken everything. Uh, and about three quarters of the time, I break everything because it's legacy code. And then they come and they tell me that it's broken. And I say, okay, do you want me to do it properly or do you want me to try and make it not broken again the way I just did? And we can repeat this for the next three weeks or we can do it properly in two weeks. Uh, it, it's the standard thing of how do you get management to care about code quality? Well, if management doesn't care about code quality, they don't care about happy customers. Um, do we have uh, more questions? Going once. Jeremy, thank you very, very much. Thanks.